enjoyed last week's message? Maybe I shouldn't ask that kind of question. But Fran did. Thank you so much, Fran. Uh, <laughs> maybe I won't get any hands up if I ask a question like that. How many of you were impacted maybe by last week's message? Maybe that's a better way to ask it. I know for me in particular, I found several moments throughout my week last week uh, to uh, put into practice battling well. Uh, and to be able to identify the enemy schemes and all of that sort of stuff that we talked about last week. And, and so we're into week two here uh, of, of the struggle is real, uh, week two. And so we're going through, as I mentioned last week, Ephesians chapter six. And, uh, and, and throughout there, there's several verses that give us insight into what God tells us through the writer Paul about how we should fight our battles. And so uh, and so we're into week two here. If you missed last week's message, please go back and watch that. Uh, it kind of sets up the rest of our time together. So we found that in John chapter 10, verse 10, uh, our theme verse for out, throughout this, this series that we're in, uh, and it says there that the thief does not come except to steal, to kill, and to destroy. I, Jesus, have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. And so just a really quick review of last week, just to hit some highlights that we discussed together. Uh, the first thing that I want to remind you of that we mentioned is that it is God's will for you to have an abundant life. God wants abundance in your life. He wants you to have an abundant marriage. He wants you to have abundant relationships. He wants your, your kids to be well-behaved and, and abundant in their vision for their lives. And so God's desire at his heart is an abundant life, a full life for you. Now, the way we define that, we've got to be careful, right? Because the way we would define abundant life may not be the way that God defines abundant life. That's a series for another day. Uh, but just be careful how you define that. But God, God wants abundance for you. He wants you to have an abundant life. The other thing that we talked about is the fact that the Bible says that we have a very real enemy. We have an adversary. We have one out there who wants to battle with us, who wants to keep us from the abundant life that God has for us. He wants to steal and to kill and to destroy. And so we have a very real enemy. And so we, we realize, we understand that God's will for us is an abundant life, but we have this enemy that wants to rob it from us. And that's why it's often so hard to realize, to achieve, to get to that place of God's desire. And so we've got to recognize up front every week of this, every week of our life, if I'm being honest, that we are in a spiritual battle. Every one of us are in a spiritual battle. And so we've got to be ready for that battle. If not, we're going to be caught off guard. We're going to be weak. We're not going to be ready to fight. And so we've got to understand that we are in a spiritual battle. And so we're walking through Ephesians, as I said, chapter 6, several verses in there. They give us insight into spiritual warfare. And, uh, and so I don't know if you've ever unpacked these, these verses before, or if you've ever focused on them very much. Uh, maybe you weren't raised in a church that talked a lot about spiritual warfare. Uh, but, but we see here from the words of Jesus that spiritual warfare is very real. And, uh, and so I believe that if you're a follower of Jesus, we should listen and, and, and know what Jesus says. And he says we're in, a, we're in a battle. We are fighting. There's an enemy out there that wants to rob us of the very thing that God wants to give us. And so we're going to jump in right up front here in Ephesians chapter 6. You can open your Bibles. They're in your sermon notes as well. We're going to start at verse 10. And it says there, finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God. You can't have victory, in other words, unless you put on the full armor of God. We talked about it last week, but how much of the armor of God should we put on? All of it. The full armor of God. The full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. Once again, we talked about it last week. The enemy, our adversary, he has a well-thought-out plan to destroy your life. He has schemes. He has, he has plans to attack you and to have victory over you. And so we've got to put on the full armor of God so we can take our stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood. So our struggle is not against people. Our struggle is not against other people. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood. Our struggle is against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God. We see it again. The full armor of God. So that when the day of evil comes, you, you may be able to stand your ground and after you have done everything to stand. And then here's where we're going to get our thought for today. It says, stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist. Stand firm. Stand firm. 
Look at your neighbor and say, stand firm. You and I, we gain victory when we stand our ground. When we stand our ground, we find victory over the enemy in our lives. When you say, I'm going to stand my ground in my marriage, you find victory over the enemy. When you say, I'm going to stand my ground in my faith, you find victory over the enemy. I'm going to stand my ground with my family, you find victory over the enemy. I'm not going to waver, in other words. I'm going to stand firm. I'm going to stand firm to what God says in His Word. I'm going to stand firm. I'm going to stand on those things. And when I've done everything I can do, I'm going to stand some more. I'm not going to waver. Far too often I have people in my office and they are wavering in the things that they know God has said. And here we see clearly, we must stand firm. Far too many people lose the battle because they aren't on firm footing. They aren't standing their ground. They know the right things. They know what the Bible says. But somehow they've convinced themselves that that truth must not be for them. Or that truth must not be for them in this situation. So they don't stand firm. They waver. And they lose the battle. Paul tells us here to stand firm with the belt of truth buckled around our waist. The first piece of armor that he unpacks for us is the belt of truth. And if we are going to have on the full armor of God... We've got to have the belt of truth firmly in place. So what I'm going to do this morning is I'm going to give you three very quick, very simple thoughts about the belt of truth to help us take steps in the direction of having it on every day, being ready to fight the battle. Here's the first one. The belt of truth is of primary importance. Primary importance. That word primary means first. In other words, it's of first importance. You may be saying, well, pastor, a belt? Really? A belt? I mean, it's not a sword. It's not a shield. It's, it's a belt. I can get behind a sword and a shield, but, but really, a belt? A belt is of primary importance? How many of you are wearing a belt today? Okay. How many of you wear a belt most days? How many of you are glad you wore a belt today? <laughs> How many of you are glad somebody else in the room wore a belt today? Okay, don't raise your hand. Don't raise your hand. <laughs> the belt is of primary importance. Don't miss it. Have you ever forgotten to wear your belt? Have you ever walked out of the house without your belt on and not realized it till maybe it was too late? I remember one time I was traveling. I was out of town traveling, and I forgot to pack my belt. Listen, if I don't have a belt on, chances are my pants are on the ground. Just the reality of it. It's just what's going to happen. And that's not a good thing. It's not a good thing. And so on this particular trip, I went to Walmart and I bought a belt. I had to, I had to fix the problem. I had to have a belt. I can't go without a belt. It was that important. And for many of us, for most of us, I would say, putting on a belt is one of the last things we do. But Paul, Paul tells us here, it should be the first thing you put on. We've got to get some historical perspective here. You see, Paul, he's, he's in a jail cell. He's, he's, he's chained literally to a Roman guard. And for Roman soldiers back in Paul's time, the belt was of primary importance because, because it held everything else together. You see, the belt back then, it held the breastplate in place. The belt back then was the place where they put their sword. You see, the belt, it was of primary importance because it held everything else to together. And Paul is telling us that just like the belt held everything together back then, for those Roman soldiers, the belt of truth that we should be wearing for our battle, it holds everything together for us. Do not underestimate the belt of truth. Everybody say truth. You can have on all of the other pieces of armor, but if you do not have on the belt of truth, you cannot experience victory 
You cannot experience the abundant life that God desires for you. Many years ago, I was at a, uh, a church function, actually, as a child. Uh, and, and interestingly enough, uh, there was a magician there. It was for a kid's event, and so they brought in a magician. Kind of an interesting thing. Uh, and, so, uh, and so I remember being mesmerized. I was probably like five or six years old, and I was mesmerized by this guy. And he did magic, and I would see trick after trick, and I was just, I was just amazed by that. I, just, I couldn't get my head around How in the world did they do that? And then as I grew up, I, I remember kind of trying to learn the trade myself, but, but I would watch uh, uh, shows, David Copperfield. Do you guys know who that guy is? Yeah, maybe, I don't know these around much anymore, but uh, David Copperfield used to be on TV, he used to have TV special, I'd watch those, and I'd just be amazed. How in the world did he cut that lady in half? How did he make that elephant disappear? How did they know exactly what card they picked? I was convinced. I was convinced at certain points that magic must be real. There must be something real about it. There's just, there's simply no other explanation. But then I learned how they did the trick. I learned that they used misdirection. Or maybe they used mirrors. Or maybe they used science to pull off the tricks that they were doing. And I learned what just really, literally, minutes before appeared to me to be unexplainable, I learned that there was something explainable happening. I learned the truth about what was going on. Before, before I learned the truth, I was living a lie. I had understood it as something magical happening, but really, they were just skilled at what they were doing. And so I was living a lie. But now, now I know the truth. And listen, listen, for far too many of us, the enemy has us in a place where we're living a lie. We're not seeing the truth. He's got us convinced that our circumstances will never be better. He's got us living and believing that we deserve the things that we're going through. He's convinced us that, 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 that we will never get past our past. And the enemy has far too many of us so deep in the lie that you can't even explain why you feel the way you feel. And if that's you, you're believing a lie. You need to put on the belt of truth. Just like my awakening to magic and the things of magic, what happened for me is that I gained what we see in John chapter 8, verse 32. It says, then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. What gives you freedom in your life? It's truth. It's seen beyond the lies to what is actual truth. And for far too many of us, we are living a lie. But when we know the truth, we will experience freedom, everybody. When you know the truth, you will live a life of victory. Just like me, when I was awakened to the truth of, of magic, not only was I no longer amazed by the tricks, I was actually able to figure out how other tricks were done. It was freeing. So where is that truth? Well, one example of that we see is in John 14, 6. Jesus answers this way. We just sang about it during the offertory. I mentioned it in my closing worship time. I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus is the truth. Jesus is the truth. When you focus on your relationship with Jesus, truth is easier to see. When you are far from him, things get blurry. When you are distant from Jesus, it's easier to buy into the lies. Jesus gives us clarity. Why? Because he is truth. He is truth. The closer you are to Jesus, the easier it is to see truth. The truth about faith, the truth about relationships, and the truth about yourself. The closer you are to Jesus, the clearer you can see truth. And so when heartaches and disappointments come, turn to Jesus. When you face something that seems insurmountable, turn to Jesus. When you can't seem to go on one more day, turn to Jesus. Jesus is truth. And it's through him and by him that we will find victory over any circumstance in our life. It's Jesus. 
Okay, so that's the first one. The belt of truth, it's of primary importance. Here's the second one. Write it down in your outline. It's that the belt of truth opposes the devil's lies. The belt of truth opposes the devil's lies. One of the main reasons why we need the belt of truth, one of the main reasons why it's of primary importance, is because we are battling a liar. If you don't have on the belt of truth, then you will not be able to tell the lies from the truth. And that's when defeat happens. That's when we are defeated in life. Satan is a liar. Here's how John 8 says it. You belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Satan, he is the creator of lies. It says there he is the father of lies. He lied to Eve in the Garden of Eden. It was his primary weapon then and it's his primary weapon today. He's a professional and he is good at what he does. He's so good, in fact, that he convinced lots of angels in heaven to follow him in his rebellion against God. He's so good that in the Garden of Eden, he convinced Adam and Eve to give up a perfect life for his lie. He's good at what he does. And you have to have on that belt of truth if you're going to live a life of victory. You've got to have it on. Revelation 12, 7 gives us insight into who he is. Then war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back. That's that war we were talking about last week. But he was not strong enough, and they lost their place in heaven. The great dragon was hurled down, that ancient serpent called the devil, or Satan, who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to earth, and his angels with him. He's so good at what he does, he's leading not just you astray, not just people here astray, but the whole world astray. If you're going to overcome this liar who's leading the whole world astray, you must have on the belt of truth. And so I want to share with you just four major lies that the enemy has in his, in his, in his weapon arsenary. Now, this isn't all-inclusive. This is something just to kind of give you some perspective on who he is and how he works. Maybe you can identify with one of these major lies of the enemy. Here's the first one. It's all about your happiness. It's all about your happiness. This lie says, God wants you to be happy. I know what the Bible says, but, but God understands with this thing, with this one, he just wants you to be happy. If you're not happy, you have to do whatever it takes to be happy. Oh, you're married to somebody who doesn't make you happy? It's okay to leave them, because God wants you to be happy. Oh, your kids don't make you happy? Well, it's okay, you don't have to spend time with them. Do what makes you happy. When you believe that happiness is God's will for you, you will compromise the word of God in order to get there. And listen, the devil wants nothing more than for you to go against the word of God to get something that will only take you further into sin and further away from God. It's one of his greatest lies. It's all about your happiness. Happiness, I'll put it this way, happiness as a pursuit and as a goal will lead you to compromise every single time. It's the first major lie of the enemy. Here's the second one. Everyone's doing it, and it's okay. Everyone's doing it, so it's okay. It's popular. Half the people are doing it. Lots of people are doing it, so it must be okay. It can't be wrong. I mean, I heard heard a PhD, and, and they're talking about it, and they say it's okay, so it must be okay. I heard a televangelist say it, so it must be okay. I know people who are doing it, so it must be okay. I mean, everybody lies. Everybody has sex outside of marriage. Everybody cheats. Everybody's partying. What is true is that 
just because everyone's doing it, it does not mean it's okay. Going with the majority does not make it right. We've got to get a hold of this one, church. Here's the third one. Here's the third major lie the enemy tells us. He tells us to live by logic. Live by logic. I mean, if it doesn't make sense to you, don't do it. I mean, you've got a brain, don't you? If it doesn't make sense to you, don't you do it. And listen, the world's logic is opposite of God's logic. Satan's kingdom is opposite of God's kingdom. In other words, in Satan's kingdom, he tells us to hold a grudge. Get even. They did you wrong, now you do them wrong. God says, truth is that you forgive. No matter what they did. Satan says, hate your enemy. You don't have to hate everybody, just hate your enemy. It's okay. It's okay to hate them. I mean, they did wrong, they're doing wrong, they believe wrong. It's okay, you can, you can hate them. God's kingdom says, no, no, no. You, you love your enemy. You pray for those that persecute you. The world's kingdom, the world's kingdom living by logic says, it's all about you. You make yourself look good. You step on others to get where you want to be. And it doesn't really matter as long as you get to success. That's all that matters. It's all about you. God says, no, you want blessing? You humble yourself and you become a servant of all. The last will be first. The devil, he, he says to us to be stingy, to be greedy. You've got to look after you. You've got to look after number one. Don't you dare give to that church. Don't you dare give to that person. Don't you dare give away what you earned. That's yours. God says, no. You help others. You give. Not, not, just, uh, not just give, but you give cheerfully. You give abundantly. The world tells us, save your life. You've only got one life. You've only got 80 years here. You better live it up. You better do all you can to make it the best 80 years of your life. Hold on to it at all costs. God says, no, lose your life for my sake. Because when you do that, that's when you find a life. And can I just say that life is not just about these 80 years. There's an eternity here. And there are far too many people focused on the 80 years and missing the eternity. They're missing eternal purposes. They're, they're missing the gospel. And they, they, they got saved, and they're just living out the rest of their years. Listen, there's ministry for all of us. There's a call for all of us on our lives. And we've got to understand eternally beyond the 80 years. Live eternally. The enemy tells us that's not logical. It doesn't make sense. Why would you do those things? I mean, they hurt you. You got to get back at them. You got to get even. That's that's life. They'll they'll trample on you again if you don't get back at them. God's kingdom isn't like that. God says forgive. Because you've been forgiven. The enemy tells us to live by logic. Here's the last one. The enemy says wrong is right. The enemy is very skilled at making wrong look like it's right. He's an illusionist. He would, he would put David Copperfield out of business. He's good at making wrong things look right. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. And no wonder, for Satan himself masquerades. He has a mask on. As what? As an angel of light. It's not surprising then if his servants also masquerades as servants of righteousness. Their end will be what their actions deserve. Listen, everybody. Satan doesn't come to us with horns, red, with a pitchfork in his hand. That's not the devil. That's a cartoon. Satan comes to us, as we see in 2 Corinthians, as an angel of light. He twists the truth. He makes what, what is wrong look like it's what's right. He did it in the Garden of Eden. Did God really say that, he said to Eve? He twists it. He makes us doubt God's word. He makes what's wrong look like it's right. 
He makes us question truth. He takes it and he twists it and he causes confusion. Listen, he makes things look so innocent. He makes the small things of life look so appealing. It's the small things. And can I just say, you only have to give the enemy just a little crack in the door. You don't have to swing the door wide open for the enemy to have a place in your life. You only have to give him a little crack. It's the small things, everybody. It's the small things in your life that gives him a a place in your life. He only needs a crack, and then he'll come in, and he will ambush you. He's the father of lies. But he always dresses it up and makes it look like it's okay. And here's the third one. The belt of truth, it prepares you for the struggle. The belt of truth, it prepares you for the struggle. Now, once again, historical kind of context here. Is that back then, in, 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 in the time when Paul was writing this, Romans, most Romans wore uh, tunics. I would call that a dress. Uh, but it's kind of like, like a long sheet with a, a hole for your head and a hole for two arms. But they wore tunics. And so the belt that they wore, they would wrap it around them. By the way, I think there's significance that the belt of truth goes all the way around. Come on, somebody. The belt of truth... It's in front of you, it's beside you, and it's behind you. The belt of truth is all the way around you. They'd wrap that belt of truth, or they'd wrap that belt around them, and then they'd take the tunic and they would tuck it in. Why? Well, they were preparing for battle. It makes them more agile, it makes them able to run. It prepared them for the battle. The belt was important. It was important to their ability to be victorious. It prepares them for the struggle. The belt itself is not a weapon. But it did prepare them for the battle. And for so many people, we're losing the battle because we are not prepared for the battle. We have to be prepared to take our stand against the enemy. 1 Thessalonians 5, 6, So then, let us not be like others who are asleep, but let us be awake and sober. Don't don't sleep. Don't sleep. Be alert. Turn to your neighbor and say, wake up. Ah, do it again. That wasn't loud enough. Tell your neighbor to wake up. They're still sleeping. You can't battle if you're sleeping. You can't do it. If you are asleep on the job, you will be defeated every single time. Be ready. Be prepared. I love what it says in 1 Peter 5, 8, 9 in the message version. It says, keep a cool head. Stay alert. The devil is poised to pounce and would like nothing better than to catch you napping. Keep your guard up. Be alert. Why? Because the devil is ready to pounce. Your enemy is ready to battle. Are you? Are you ready to battle? So keep your guard up. Be prepared. Stay awake. Stay alert. Far too many of us are napping. We're sleeping. We aren't awakened to the things that the enemy is trying to do to defeat us. Ephesians 4.27 And do not give the enemy a foothold a foothold it's this idea of a secure spot maybe you would envision it like going rock climbing or something and you go and you're you're trying to find the next place to put your foot and that's your foothold because it becomes a secure spot that you can't step away from I have with me my handy dandy step stool Trent, can you come up here for a second? You guys give Trent a round of applause. He's coming up having no idea why. That was weak, really? That's the best you can do for him? Man, you deserve so much more. I just wonder if you might pick that up. Round of applause. Good. This step stool represents you and me. And you see, when we're, when we're battling right, it's easy to be lifted. It's easy to stand tall. It's easy to see things clearly. But when the enemy comes along and you give him a foothold in your life, now this is just for illustration purposes. I'm not really Satan. I'm a pastor. I just want to be clear about that. But for the purposes of this, that's you and I'm the devil and you've given me a foothold. You've given him a foothold in your life. And so now he's standing on you. Trent, would you like to try to pick up the step stool right now? Yeah, I don't think it would be a good idea either. 
Because what happens is, when we give the enemy a foothold in our lives, we can't be lifted. We're weighed down. We can't move. He's been given this foothold in our life. And we are stuck. That's why it says in Ephesians, don't even give him a foothold. Don't let him have a foot in your life. Don't let him have that secure spot in your life because you won't be able to move. You will be trampled. In fact, the Word of God says that Jesus will trample him under his feet. But instead, we're giving him a foothold and we are being trampled. Thank you, Trent. Appreciate it. Give him another round of applause. It's a foothold. And I wonder how many of us have given him that. I remember many years ago when I was 18 years old, I was making the drive to Orlando, Florida from Muncie, Indiana. And, uh, and I was driving with a friend of mine, and we decided we were going to drive straight through. Anybody ever made that drive straight through from Indiana to Florida? Yeah. It's a, it's a longer drive. There's probably worse drives, but it's, it's kind of long. And, uh, and so we agreed, my friend and I, you know, we would switch off every couple of hours so that way we could stay fresh and, and we could make the drive safely. Well, I was 18. And uh, I was like, ah, I'm good. I'm good. I got this. I'm young. I'm vibrant. I don't need to nap when it's not my turn to drive. And so I stayed awake. So the first few times that it was my turn, ah, everything was okay. But then the sun went down. And it got dark. And I remember driving this vehicle that wasn't mine. It was his. And I remember driving late at night, middle of the night. It had to be 2, 3 in the morning probably. And, and maybe you've been there. I hope you haven't. But maybe you've been there and you start doing this thing. Anybody been there? And he's in the seat next to me sound asleep because he's smart. He's napping and his time's not to drive. I didn't do that. And so I'm driving in my head. We, start, we call this the head bob. It's like, it's like that, that thing you do when you're starting to fall asleep. And I remember portions of that drive. Well, I should say, I don't remember portions of that drive. I remember times, though, when I would swerve off the road and then I'd, I'd pop back up, right? You ever been there? That's a scary moment in life. I wasn't ready. I wasn't prepared. I needed to sleep, even. But because I didn't sleep, I needed to sleep, and that gave me a dangerous place in my life. Far too many of us we're going through life. And we're at the steering wheel. And we're doing this. And every time we do that, we swerve off the road. Every time we do that, we're giving the enemy access into our life. We've convinced ourselves somehow, I, I'm okay. I, I can keep driving. I don't need to slow down. I don't need to take time off. I don't need to rest. I'm good. I can do this. I know pastor said put on the belt of truth, but I'm good. I grew up in church. I know what the Bible says. I don't need to read it today. We're swerving. We're swerving off the road. We're sleeping. We're battling, but we're losing. We've given the enemy a foothold. My big idea for you today is this. That when you battle, when you're in the struggle, use truth to overcome the lies. Use truth. It's no coincidence that I capitalized the T. Use truth to overcome the lies. John 17, 17. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. Worship team, you can come back up. As I said last week, we are all either in the middle of a struggle, coming out of our struggle, or headed into one. We all, every one of us, need this strategy, the belt of truth, to overcome and to be victorious. Jesus is truth. God's word, the Bible, is truth. Get this, everybody. If you are not focused on your relationship with Jesus, if you are not digging into his word to learn truth, 
you are going to be deceived. We must get into God's word. We must have a deep and abiding relationship with Jesus. Because when the enemy is hurling lie after lie, don't give him the foothold. Don't give up the ground. Don't give up territory in your heart, in your mind, anywhere in your life to allow him to step on you, to have that foothold. Because listen, when truth is here, the enemy has nowhere to put his foot. When, the enemy is pre- or when truth is present, the enemy has nowhere to stand. When we proclaim truth, the enemy will flee. Don't give him that foothold. Battle against him and his lies with truth. Everybody bow your heads and close your eyes, please. I just want to ask you to ask God what he's saying to you right now. What is it that you've heard here today or felt or sensed that might be God's spirit prompting you in something? He may be showing you a place in your life where you've given the enemy a foothold, where he is standing there and he is not relinquishing control. Maybe it's an addiction. Maybe it's a past hurt. Maybe it's unforgiveness in your life. Maybe he's showing you a place in your life where you've believed a lie about yourself. Where you wake up every morning and you feel like an imposter. You wake up believing, man, if if others just knew the truth about me, nobody would like me. It's a lie. And it keeps you from deep and meaningful relationships. What is it that he's saying to you right now? God, my prayer right now is that each one of us would recognize the lies of the enemy in our life. God, that we would take every thought captive and that we'd make it obedient to your truth. That God, that as we're fighting the battle, as we're in the middle of the struggle, God, help us to see truth. God, give us perspective. Give us eyes to see. And God, give us diligence and and, and the ability to just get into your word more and more and more. To understand what it says about us and about our circumstances and about life. My prayer is that each one of us would be prompted to seek truth more and more in our lives. And as we do, that God, that that we'll see the enemy's influence in our life less and less. That he will truly flee from our midst. In Jesus' name. The ushers, they're going to go ahead and come into place to uh, distribute communion elements. We do this on the first Sunday of every month. And I, I thought it was appropriate as we're focused on our relationship with Jesus as truth. Jesus is truth. That it might be good even even with this, to, to say to him, you are truth. And then no matter what lie comes my way, when I'm communing with you, I can battle against it. I can fight against it. And so can I encourage you right now to not just make this another mundane month of taking communion, but make it your very act of worship, your very prayer. Guys, you can go ahead and begin to distribute. Go ahead, go ahead and distribute, guys. Uh, you, make this your prayer, make this your worship make this everything for you with Jesus right now in this moment and you don't have to be a member here we just ask that you, that you love Jesus that he's your Lord and Savior and then just hold on to the elements for just a moment I'm going to go ahead and lead us in the moment Thank you. maybe you want to bow your head and say a quick prayer before you receive but let this draw you close to him Allow this to be another step in your walk to see truth. Because the truth of what these elements represent is that it is finished. 
The body of Jesus, the blood of Jesus represents finished work for each one of us. That means no more striving, no more working. It's a free gift of salvation that each of us receive. So we're reminded right now of that, whether it's been decades or days since that has happened for you. It is finished. So as you hold on to the elements, just whisper a prayer to God. Allow this to be a meaningful moment for you today. Can I just let you all in on a little spiritual secret? When you focus your life on spiritual warfare, you're probably going to be battling spiritual warfare soon. When you go from here, there might have been something that was stirred in your heart today in these moments. And when you leave from here today, the enemy will say to you, Nah, that wasn't real. That wasn't God. That fight that you had with your spouse coming on to the way to church, that, that, that awkwardness between the two of you because you fought on the way here, that's going to exist when you leave here today. You're going to have a chance to put into practice every single time whenever you hear a message on spiritual warfare. It happens. And can I just submit to you a pastoral truth? When I preach on spiritual warfare, I'm engaged in it every single time. It's not the first message and series I've done on sports, spiritual warfare. Every single time, things happen in my life that I know are because I'm preaching on this type of message. All I'm saying is, be prepared. Be ready. Because we can all be victorious. None of us, none of us need to be defeated. But it's about seeing past the lies right now. It's about seeing beyond the lies. So I want you to be prepared. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. God, we thank you so much for what this represents, your broken body. Your body that was punished, that took, took our sin upon it. God, we are just so thankful right now in this moment that you would do that for us so that we might have relationship with you. God, I can't imagine fighting the battle without you on my side. I can't imagine going through the things that I'm going through without you. So God, we thank you for your broken body. We thank that you loved us so much that you would do that for us. And so right now in this moment, we remember, we look back and we say thank you. We worship you in these moments. And God, we pray that your, your act, your, your moment of punishment, God, that that would become uh, inspirational to us. That God, that that would become life-changing to us. That God, that we would understand that the things that we battle against are temporary. That God, that we have a secure eternal life with you. So God, we receive this bread in the name of Jesus. Everybody take the bread together. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. God, your blood covers over all sin. Your blood makes us white as snow. God, your blood puts us in right standing with you. And it is a free gift. It's not because of anything we've done. It's not because of anything other than just that you loved us. So God, we pray for forgiveness. We pray for that, that uh, a prayer of repentance right now for those times when we've turned away from you. God, may we be covered in your blood again. Your blood that brings healing. Your blood that brings hope and purpose into our lives. Your blood that is truth. 
to fight against the lies of the enemy. And so God, today we receive this cup, remembering all that you've done for us. In Jesus' name, strength the cup. Thank you, Jesus. I want to invite you to stand to your feet. The ushers are going to come by and collect the cups. And as they do, can I just encourage you once again to dig into worship. This song in particular, it should move you because it's full of truth. Let's worship God together.
worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Oh, sing it again. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, that is who you are. Let's sing, that is who you are. That is who you are. That is who you are. He's this for you today. Whatever that you need, he is there. That is who you are. See it, Jesus. This is who you are to that me. Is who you are. You're my way maker, that Jesus. You are my, you my miracle are. worker. That Jesus, is who all those you promises are. that all those promises of truth that in your word. worker. God, we have seen you do it time and time again, and we know you're not finished. God, you've only just gotten started. And so, God, those miracles that we're believing for, we know that they will come to pass. In Jesus' name. Oh, God, you're a promise keeper. God, all of your promises are yes and amen. God, everything that is written in your word will come to pass. God, we can lean on your promises because they are true and you are faithful. That's just who you are. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you that you meet us here each and every week. That, God, that you, you are truly speaking to us and changing lives. And so, God, as we take steps this week to search out truth, to live by truth, God, we pray that you would meet us there as well. God, that we would be able to see past the lies. To battle against the enemy who is the father of lies. Truth will always win out. So God, we thank you for victory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well now, the blessing, if you'll receive it today. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all as you search truth against the lies. In Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you all. Have a great rest of your Sunday.